All right, good evening, everyone. Let's call to order the Housing Planning and Development Committee meeting. Um, thank you to my colleagues for attending. We have a lighter attendance than I hoped for tonight because of, I think, just some personal um, uh, uh, conflicts on the part of one committee member and, and one non-committee member. Uh, we may have another council member or two join uh, before um, we are through our full hour. I'm going to call up the agenda here formally. So first I'd like to approve the move to approve the minutes of the October 23 uh, Housing Planning and Development Committee meeting. Is there a second? Motion been, uh, did I move? Anyway, I right, moved. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed the ayes have it. So that brings us to our next um, item on the agenda, which is Ordinance 7-2023, a proposed ordinance brought by my colleague on the committee, uh, Jason Schachner, originally um, some months ago, and it's been referred jointly to this committee and to the Planning Commission. And at um, uh, our invitation tonight, uh, members of the Planning Commission are with us. Um, it's not a joint hearing, but um, just for simplicity of scheduling, but in effect, what we'd love to do is have the chance to hear from the Planning Commission members their logic as, as uh, all of you work through this proposal and, as I understand, have reshaped, improved, iterated the proposal in um, uh, good faith work with the Planning Department and their staff and the legal department who's represented here tonight. And so it sounds like what we've got is a very successful proposal for our consideration in, in the, on the City Council side of things. So um, before going any further, I'd like to say welcome to the members of the Planning Commission, um, and, and we appreciate you being here. Uh, council colleagues, uh, any opening comments, questions, or thoughts before we dive in? Mr. Schachner. Yeah, the only comment would be to thank you guys for all your um, work on this and your recommendations, you really did improve the ordinance tremendously. And I want to thank the planning department for their pretty much three years of work on this um, in different iterations and different uh, research. I mean, this was not something that was just pulled out of thin air. Um, and I think it's apparent by the language and the changes made that there was a lot of thought put into it. There's a lot of thought in the original proposal from the planning department. and definitely a lot of thought from the recommendations of the Planning Commission, so thank you. Thank you. Um, and what, what I'm hoping to do on Council and in this committee is to uh, use our discussion tonight to get into the public record and, uh, uh, you know, what, what the thought processes are here, what the proposal, if it's adopted, would accomplish, what it would not accomplish because it's a tool in the toolbox. It can do some things but not other things. Um, and to help not only the public understand that, but also to deepen um, the expertise on the city council side of the desk here. I know that uh, a number of my colleagues, and, and me too, uh, are keenly interested in affordable housing. Um, and we've done a fair amount of, of work, deliberation, investigation, uh, as has the planning department under Director Leininger's leadership on that topic. I believe that part but not all of the impetus behind this initial proposal by Councilman Schachner was to see if we could enhance uh, uh, the supply of affordable housing in the community. Um, but that's not the only goal of our housing policy in a city of century homes. Uh, largely, you know, the, the great majority of our housing stock built prior to World War I, whereas many or most other Cuyahoga communities are built after World War II, were built prior to World War I. And so that really informs not only all housing policy in Lakewood, but really um, everything else that we do as a city government and as a community, um, or the lion's share of it. So it's um, worth our time, and it's worth, um, I think it has been worth the time of, of, of all of us. But anyway, that's the intent. My hope tonight is to, to really uh, deep in City Council's understanding of, of what this proposal is and what it could do for the community. And if I could just yes. add something, thanks. Um, I think the reality of accessory dwelling units or ADUs, it, the one thing it addresses is um, it removes 
the land acquisition in terms of building any additional um, space or dwelling units, um, mostly for, um, like if somebody wanted to, you know, build a house here or build a home for a relative to live in. I mean, you're, there's no property available just to purchase, no vacant lots. And if there was a vacant lot, it would most likely be extraordinarily expensive unless it's one of those um, home lots uh, that we have. Um, so it, it, that's where a lot of communities around the country have found the cost savings in terms of, though it still would be relatively expensive to build an ADU, it removes one portion of the equation there, which is the acquisition of land. And again, I think it's many of our discussions have gone about affordable housing and just the reality, there's just really only a couple or several ways for affordable housing to exist or to create it, so to speak. One is to make the city a worse place to live in and prices will go down. Um, that's one way to do it. Not a popular way, and I don't think anybody wants to see that. So that's not a way that is going to happen, but theoretically, that's one way. Number two is a huge subsidy from either the federal government or city government, because affordable housing costs exactly the same as market rate housing to build. Um, there's, that's just the way it is. You can't just build affordable housing in an affordable way. It costs the same. So if you're, if anybody, if a private entity is going to build it, they need to be majorly subsidized if not fully subsidized by taxpayer, do taxpayer dollars. The third is, of course, time, um, which would be you encourage new developments, new housing in the city, and over time, new housing becomes old housing. And when that occurs, um, prices go down because they're not top of the line anymore. But uh, I think we've had a long conversation, and through the you know, research and the many meetings we have, I think it we it's important for the city and most governments to be honest with people in cities like Lakewood and entering suburbs that are on the rise that it's not really a policy choice to not have affordable housing. It's the reality of the state we live in. You can't do rent control in the state of Ohio. It's not allowed. No, so I see that sometimes thrown around, just do rent control. It's illegal, we can't do it. Um, the state has forbid us from doing that. Um, there are just some policies that exist, that tools that other states have or other municipalities in other states have that in Ohio we don't. We have some tax incentives that we use, um, like our community reinvestment area that provides some below market rate um, units for a period of time while that um, uh, abatement period exists. But again, as people sh should know, it's a government subsidy. So when they say, hey, why doesn't the city just build affordable housing in this one area? The city doesn't build anything, one. And two, you can't just build affordable housing. It's, that's not a thing that exists practically. So. Thanks. And so we're kind of talk, considering the big picture, the small picture. Councilman Rader, you want to join us? That'd be great. Um, we're just getting underway. Um, so, uh, and, and we'll dive in in a second. Just in addition to affordable, what are some of the other goals for our housing stock? It would be well-maintained, well, quality, safe, um, and ADA accessible or aging place. Um, those are related, although d different because not everybody who needs ADA access is, um, is an, a person in their senior years. There may be some other category I'm missing, but affordability has come up recently because our property values have increased. Now, that is actually um, a positive thing in, in many regards. It's just that it's, it's on the minds of many people in the community. So um, without belaboring the point further, Mr. Krusen, you're the chair of the Planning Commission. Uh, thank you for your service. Would you like any quick preliminary remarks before we get to a presentation by the director? Hey, can you put your mic on? Thank you. Sorry, I'll just say that um, 
no, I, I've been very appreciative of the process, and it's been, I think, productive. And um, I think I, I feel confident. I think I think I can speak for the other members as well that we, we feel confident with where it wound up and what's ultimately uh, kicked over to council. So I'm um, looking forward to further discussion about how we kind of arrived where we arrived today. Okay, and and by the way, we've got Kyle Krusen, Chair Nick Lapointe, Bill Sanderson, and Sean McDermott, four of our five Planning Commission members, with us tonight. Thank you, gentlemen, for your service. Uh, Director Leininger, any um, remarks about tonight's proposal? Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I, I do have a, a brief presentation. If you'd like me to get into that, I'd be happy to. Okay. Uh, first of all, let me just start with thanking the Planning Commissioner for spending an, another evening uh, with us on this topic. Um, and thank you for your, your your work through this through this conversation, which I, I, I thought it was a very productive conversation. I think it's reflected in the work that, that the the work product that came out of it. Um, ultimately, I think we have a much better ordinance than, than where we started six months or so ago. Um, so with that, I, I do have some just some some comments about the how we got to where we are. Um, I'm going to try and be brief. Um, there's a lot of code changes. I'm not going to go through them line by line. Just trust that you've all had this for now for a little bit. You've had a chance to look at it and we can just kind of answer some questions, but just maybe go back to the beginning, just to remind everybody where we started. Um, this was the priorities of the, of the proposed legislation um, with a couple modif with a small modification at the end. I know we just talked about affordability, um, but where we started from just a whole host of conversations over the last several years is what are we trying to do with the, with the ADU legislation? Um, and really came down to four priorities, aging in place, shared living, maintaining that neighborhood character, and we also talked about affordability. Now, affordability in this case is a double-edged sword because the, the cost to build housing is, is, is the same whether it's affordable or not. Um, certainly, are there some benefits that come out of, out of, out of ADUs that, that can help a new homeowner, uh, someone who's not quite ready to take on or, or help provide a sec additional income to help support um, um, their, their mortgage, their, their property taxes? Yes. Does it put supply in the market? Yes. Can it create housing for um, uh, maybe a retired senior, a retired mom and dad to come home um, and, and be with be with an adult child, or even bring uh, a child home from school, which I'll, hopefully I'll be there in a few years if he makes it. Um, but there are some definitely some positive things that can come out from 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 the ADUs from an affordability standpoint. But those those first three were really kind of the, the primary drivers for this. Um, also, now, you'll see this as we go through the slides, but you, you see some of those others, uh, the, the images that come from AARP are, are, are whited out, grayed out. Um, when we started this process, we really were focusing on how do we take advantage of the existing single family structure, primarily or well, only in the R2 district. So we were talking about how we can use attic space, how we can use basement space, how we might be able to do an addition off to the, off to the side of, of an existing single family home. Where we went through this process, we end up kind of on its end um, and thought more about how do we do, still do the additions, but how can we consider, reconsider uh, detached units or conversions of garages over the garage, not a conversion of the garage, but adding space onto a garage to create ADUs. And so um, it was, in, it was it didn't quite come full circle, but, but really through the analysis and the great questions that were asked by the Planning Commission, um, uh, took a, a different focus with, with the ordinance. So again, where we started, there were really three simple changes that, that we started from. Uh, the first was to eliminate our prohibition in our zoning code, which applies to any single family structure in the city cannot be enlarged for, uh, to accommodate more than one family. Where we, were, where we were keenly focusing on this was in the R2 zoning district, because in the R2 zoning district, you're allowed to have both a single family and a two family dwelling unit. So even though in the R2 zoning district, even though you're zoned R2 and you have a single family home, most other places without this restriction, you, wouldn't, you would be allowed to add a second unit to, to that property by right. This took that right away. So we started from the premise of well, let's take this standard, let's take this, this prohibition away, uh, particularly in the R2 district and allow people to add second units onto their, onto their property. And what that did is it really impacted, so what's highlighted, everything that has a color on here is, is something that's zoned R2 um, and really what we were talking about are all those that are red. So those one family lots that, that could have been expanded to a second unit. Um, we had some differences and the GIS was putting out different outputs as far as how many units there are. Um, I think before we had a number that had it closer to 6,000. We feel more confident that this 49, almost 5,000 units is, is, the, is the accurate number as we, we dove into the, the data that we were using a little bit more. 
But so we were talking about impacting 5,000 units or 5,000 lots in the city um, with this change and continue to, to impact 5,000 units with the, with the proposed changes uh, that are in front of you this evening. Uh, and then the other change we were talking about were to the maximum lot coverage. Um, this was to help people uh, re really remove barriers so that people, home families could add on to their, their, their homes and not be constrained by the, by the maximum lot coverage of 25%, which as we did some BZA analysis, it did come up um, more often than actually when we realized um, in the last uh, three years. So uh, removing this uh, to increase the lot coverage to 35%. And that 35% number was deliberate because this is, these are the standard lot sizes in the R1, L, M, H, and R2. So it's all of our single family zonings and that R2 single and two family zoning that I was talking, that I mentioned earlier. Uh, basically this is showing a standard or a minimum lot size for each one of those zoning categories. Showing when you apply the setbacks and what your buildable area would actually be. Um, and then we were, because of the, the lot coverage restriction, we were only utilizing 25, we, were, we weren't utilizing all the building envelope that was permitted when you applied the setbacks. So by, I, by the way, Director, to interject, this is a description right now of where the proposal began. This is. Okay, so you're giving us a rewind. Rewind to remind you where we were and where, okay, we're, where we're at good. today. So a lot of this is still applicable um, in, the, in the new ordinance. But then we were gonna increase it to 35%, really to take advantage of the full building envelope that was allowed by, by the code. When we went to planning commission, and you'll, you'll hear from each one of these, uh, each one of the commissioners individually, um, and dangerous as this may be, I tried to synthesize this down into to five points, at least I think we walked away with as staff, and we shared a lot of these points with the planning commission and kind of put their words back in front of them uh, through the series of meetings that we had. Um, but as planning any, commission, any angry rebuttals, planning commission of this slide? I'm, I'm just ready. teasing. <laughs> all right, go ahead. Sorry. That's all right. Um, so overall, the feedback we got as we as we present is overall they supported the goals of the ordinance. The, the, the goals, the intentions were in the right place, but it was really a, it was a matter of how we were getting there. Um, and by that I mean, the planning commission asked us that that in supporting those those goals that we protect. Um, home ownership, that we protect single family structures, of which we talked about. Many of them are, are historic in nature, whether they're, they're officially designated or just by, by the nature of their character and their age, they are historic. Um, and also protecting the character of the neighborhood. Um, so as we think about, do we allow, do we require parking for ADUs? Do we not require parking? Where do we place the ADU? How do we protect that overall character of the neighborhood? Um, so as a result of that, we, we got some feedback that they, the, the, the conversion of the existing single family homes was not supported, which is the direction we were on. Um, so taking a single family home and then one of the most common things you could probably do is take and split it a stack double. So you'd have a unit on the first floor, a unit on the second floor. There's probably some you might be able to, to, to split it horizontally, but that was a, when you make a change like that to a single family home, that change can be very permanent. Um, which in a lot of cases these will be permanent changes, but if, if we can protect the integrity of that single family home, let's do that and think about how we put additions on the homes without impacting that single family structure. How do we put detached units on there? And so that's the next point is, is thinking about how do we execute this by, with, those, with those protections that, that the Planning Commission wanted us to consider. Uh, and the last point then was, um, and I think this was really a good takeaway from this, um, the fact that by increasing the principal, and it really brought to light the lack of requirements in the city, by increasing the impervious lot coverage, that was generally, or the lot coverage for the principal structure, that was, that was supported. But we had a larger issue in our code in the fact that there was nothing that prohibited anybody from paving, if you will, creating large parking areas in their backyard, creating, filling up their entire backyards, their entire properties for that matter, with impervious area. So the commission challenged us to go on, if, hey, if we're gonna go on this path, let's go ahead and set something that at least puts uh, an upper limit on, on what we can do uh, as far as impervious coverage. On, on which, which council colleagues I have seen in Ohio City and uh, Gordon Square Arts District, there'll be accessory dwelling unit structures, uh, standalone structures to the rear in a fair number of um, Cleveland homes and half, eh, some of the time there'll be an entirely paved courtyard um, in between. So it's a valid yeah. point. And most communities do have a maximum lot coverage, uh, regardless of, of the zoning district or even the age of the community. There's, there's usually some upper limit. 
So we went ahead and did that. We went and put those, those, those items into the code. Um, and again, this is where we're gonna get into the code a little bit. Um, I'm not gonna read all of these to you again, but just to, to walk you through the changes that we made. So we went from those three changes to now um, um, maybe a couple handfuls of changes to different zoning ordinances within the city. The first thing that we had to do is we had to establish some, some definitions uh, for what an accessory dwelling unit is. Um, thankfully, the city of Cincinnati is going through this exercise or has already just gone through this exercise and allowed accessory dwelling units uh, in their community back, uh, I believe it went into effect this June. They had an amazing definition that we lifted from them. Uh, it fits here very well, um, so we, we, we just kept it. Uh, we then went and uh, developed a uh, lot coverage definition. We already had a definition in our code, but now we had to define this for, for what the maximum lot coverage is. And so this basically sets up and says anything that's, bas that's impervious, uh, unless it has a stormwater benefit, a demonstrated stormwater benefit, it's considered impervious and it counts against your lot coverage maximum. So that kind of sets the stage um, for the edits moving forward. Um, we had to tweak some of our, 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 def, or our, our accessory use sections and then our maximum lot coverage. So this is a single family district. So this is R1, L, M. So L is low density. Um, Sean, can I stop you real quick? Yeah. Sorry. Just going back to the lot coverage maximum. Yep. Um, so I see the intent is to encourage the use of impervious or maybe impervious, imper Pervious. sorry. <laughs> Or, um, things but it says that the way I read it is that you'd have to even though it allows some infiltration such as decks patios driveways pores pavers or concrete or other ones that deserve ground whatever that you have to prove it's demonstrated as a functional and integral part of a stormwater system I mean I don't know if people when they build their Patios think of it being an integral part of a stormwater system. I don't. I just curious at how that how people meet that burden for it to not be counted as part of the maximum so lot coverage. Just putting in a paver patio mm -hmm. would not qualify as being a pervious system or being a pervious system because it has no stormwater benefit. Okay. Um, it's just a type of material. It still is is for all intents and purposes. It is a is a impervious surface. Um, unless it then has some type of underdrain system that then, then, and I'm not an engineer, but has some type of other purpose where it where it's, has a, a storage or a water quality treatment component to it. So the homeowner would have to show, hey, I built this deck and look at how the water is handled, is handled this way, and then that would be approved by the city engineer, and then at that point it would not be counted towards the? Yes. If we got, if you were trying, if you, the only time that would matter is if you were going to exceed that upper limit of, of maximum lot coverage, which we set that at a point that gives people reasonable use and enjoyment of their property to be able to establish decks and patios and, and all these things. So um, it's, it would be in those rare instances where they're not meeting that maximum requirement. Okay. Following on that point, so crushed gravel uh, sitting area around a backyard fire pit uh, or a porous paver or pavement element seems that it would qualify as a stormwater compatible functioning, right? And so, um, so there would need to be some formal process by which that gets reported to and acknowledged by the city engineer. Uh, the city engineer, I doubt, has definitions for all of this today. No. We could borrow heavily from Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District which has got a pretty extensive book on this and topic. soil and water. Soil and water. So is that our intent? I mean, that uh, seems to me to be worth some follow-up, um, not today, but. Yeah, the ODNR, OEPA, uh, Cuyahoga Soil and Water, they all have uh, many, many documents that they put okay. together that talk so, about so that. So that's not defined language. in this proposal. It, it'd be an administrative function. Correct. I just, uh, to me, that's a perfect example of how it's important to nail down what the, um, you know, how that's going to be handled by the administration. I'm um, comfortable with this language as long as, as we do follow up on that because city engineer handles a bunch of stuff. City engineer's training is probably on on other matters, and this is a specialty topic. So 
Can we informally commit to do some follow-up on, sure. on this point? Okay, any thoughts on that point by the Planning Commission beyond what? Okay. Yes, Mr. Cruson. I think that makes sense. Okay, thanks. Uh, Councilman Shackner, did that cover your point? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, let's, let's keep charging ahead. And if you don't mind talking like a New York City auctioneer, that would be great so we can All right. <laughs> reserve time for uh, Q&A. Thanks. So I won't spend much time on permitted accessory uses. So this was a lot of, this, this was actually a, uh, a cleanup of some language, just that if we're going to establish a maximum lot coverage, we had to go through and clean up some of the language in here to make sure that it was, because this was, this language basically said that despite whatever it says over here, you're allowed to do this. And that our goal was to know this, this is this 85%, whatever the percentage is, it, this is the maximum. So that's what these, this cleanup was. Um, and then this section deals with you know, actually establishing what the maximum lot coverage is in our single family zoning district. Um, so because the R1L, or I'm sorry, I'll start it backwards. So the, the, the R1H was our highest density, our smallest lot, highest density zoning district. We established a, 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 a higher uh, lot percentage. Um, it's, it's intended to be somewhat proportional. It's, it's not exactly proportional because um, our lot size aren't exactly proportional. But basically, as, as smaller lots are allowed to have more lot coverage, larger lots are allowed to have less lot coverage, even though even by the nature of them being larger, they, they can have more impervious area. But you don't have R2 here. R2 is in a separate section, so we're okay. getting to that. Okay, very yep. good. And, and um, Planning Commission, why are these the right levels as opposed to a different number? Or is that a recommendation by the director? Yeah, I think we, we relied heavily on the city's analysis. Okay. So if, we, if, if time allows, I mean, I can pull up near maps. We can look at some of the examples that we looked at to say, just to try to arrive at, hey, when we look at a standard lot in the city, when we look at a standard development pattern on a standard lot in the city, here's the lot coverages that we're seeing, and then allow people some flexibility to still do Okay, so you keyed property. it off of actual conditions in Lakewood yes. or by peer, in peer cities or No, ex existing former. conditions in Lakewood. Okay, okay. Yeah. And, and is that satisfactory from, um, you know, part, colleagues, part of the reason I went to the Planning Commission here is this is their field, this is their expertise, not only by training, but by years of experience in development, in building code, in uh, planning and uh, Mr. LaPointe, I don't know what your um, background is, if, but, but I know it's, it's extensive. So um, from your perspective, is that a good methodology? I, I think so. I mean, we, uh, during the meetings, you know, the city did do that analysis in real time and, and we went neighborhood by neighborhood and they, and they showed examples and, and, and I think we were satisfied. Okay. And the idea is that does continue, that's continuous with the character, which was one of the key policy outcomes you were seeing. All right, so I'm just getting that on the record. Thanks, Director, so please uh, continue. So I won't zoom in on this. So similar to the 1120-103 where we did some cleanup just to an acknowledgement that there's now a maximum lot coverage requirement, this is the exact same thing just happening in 1123, which is the R2, the single and two-family zoning district. So, so what was that number again? Can you go back? It's... So this up. is 11... So there... there for R2, I mean. For R2, we'll, we'll come up on that. Okay, we haven't gotten I, to that I'm, number yet. I'm sorry. So it's going to be 85%, similar to, because the, the R2 lot size is, is I think it might even be the same as the R1H. Got it. So we've followed the same methodology, the same okay. the same treatment of, Understood. of, of that. Um, so because we are only allowing ADUs in the R2 district, we amended 11.2304 to explicitly state that accessory dwelling units are permitted in the R2 district as a conditionally permitted use. And only R2. And only R2. Okay. And so conditionally permitted for the record means that um, property owners can confidently propose it, but they don't get it used by right. They do have to come before which, ABR or Planning Commission? Planning, Planning Commission. Commission. Okay. And we establish, and you'll see this in Chapter 1161, we establish some pretty, I think they're pretty clear standards for if you can meet these standards, then, and you're not a detriment to your surrounding neighborhood, then then it should be a, 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 a property owner should have a pretty good understanding of where they are in that, in that okay, process. Okay, and after a planning commission review, they would all, or conditional use approval, they would also then go before ABR if there are they architectural would. and building code, or, Absolutely. you know, building, which there's gonna be. Um, almost inevitably, right? Unless it's just an internal 
No, ABR. ABR review is required okay. um, in 1161. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, Councilman, you had asked about the, the lot coverage requirement. Here it is. It's 85% uh, in the R2 district. And, again, it's, it's for the same reason um, that I mentioned previously. It's the same lot size as the R1H. Okay. Um, you also note that um, we do have restrictions on the size of accessory structures, so sheds, garages, things that are detached and, and accessory to the primary to principal use. It's set at 25%. Um, we, we did, because um, we want to support ADUs, we did not include accessory dwelling units in that 25% calculation. So if someone has a garage and that garage is, takes up to 25% of their rear, y lot, rear yard, you aren't, all, you aren't prohibited from then having an ADU. You're allowed to have an ADU, but you're subject to the maximum 85% lot coverage okay. requirement. So that makes sure that, that someone's not going to have to go to variance every time they want to have an ADU. Uh, so this uh, is this, the prohibition section. Um, even though we're not repealing it anymore, we do need to amend it uh, to basically state that you can't expand it unless you're creating an accessory dwelling unit. And again, that was for all the reasons we talked about, protecting that single family home, um, the neighborhood, but then allowing accessory dwelling units on the property. Okay, very good question about this. Go ahead, Mr. Rader. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thanks everyone for being here. This is great. So. This whole, uh, you know, I've, I've had a lot of conversation over the last few years about garages being able to demolish them and having to build them in the same footprint as, as the current garage. And it seems, I've always thought that to be, that to be sort of restrictive. Um, but just because we've had these conversations and had neighbors and things going through this process of I want to build a bigger garage or I want to build a smaller garage, the city's making me build a garage in this exact same footprint and I've got to build it the same height and do all this stuff that our code requires. Um, will those same codes, codes apply if somebody says wants to knock down their garage, build a garage with an accessory dwelling unit inside, make it bigger to accommodate the accessory dwelling? Does this definition then allow them to sort of, you know, go outside of that current uh, restriction, which again, I, I think it's a little bit onerous in today's, you know, but, but I'm just wondering of how those, those codes comport. And there's a lot of them. There's a lot of individual codes yeah. kind of spread out that, that dictate sort of how that process is, is supposed to happen. So. so when it comes to a garage, um, when someone wants to put a, a, an addition on their garage, let's say they want to go vertical, um, we, there's language on 1161, the next section we're going to get to, that talks about that you, you, you really need to go to the building department because our building code standards have changed. A lot of our garages aren't on a full footer foundation like they would need to be to support and have a, a unit above. So they'll probably need to tear down and start over. If it's a garage, they will be limited to that 25% or 480 square feet. But there's no restrict. There's nothing that prohibits them like there is now from then if they put an addition, if, if they put space above the garage, there's nothing. This eliminates any restrictions that they couldn't turn that into a, a an accessory dwelling unit. Okay. Um, the same setback standards, the same height standards, all of that still applies but the use is now permitted. Because right now, people come into us and they, they put storage above the garage. They put an office above their garage. Mm -hmm. um, even though it might have a bathroom in it, so it's not supposed to be used as an accessory dwelling yet. This now allows that to happen. The other way they can, they can utilize their existing garage is there's nothing prohibiting them from adding on to the side of their garage. Okay. And we won't count that square footage if it's for the accessory dwelling unit. Again, if their garage is already maxed out in size, and they, it's, they don't want to go vertical because it's too expensive or whatever, they can also come off to the side of their garage and just have the accessory dwelling unit attached to it and take advantage of any electric service or things that might already be in that building um, to help support the accessory unit. Yeah, that's helpful. All right, thank you. I'm, I'm just thinking about some specific cases of people who have talked to me about how they might do this and then others who just want to get rid of their garage and maybe build something else that makes more sense in today's. Yep. Uh, so that, They're allowed to do that. that makes sense. Thank you so much. Uh, and so then the final section, are really the meat of where the changes are. Um, oh, hang on, I didn't change. Uh, 1161. Uh, so this is our conditional use standards. Um, so again, you're allowed to have accessory dwelling units in the R2 district. It does require to have a conditional use, and these are the standards that are applied for you to have this uh, to have an accessory dwelling unit. So um, it has to be 
the, the R2 zoning that it's allowed on, there can only be one dwelling unit on the property now. So if you already have a duplex on your property in the R2 district, you cannot go and add another unit to now have three units on a, on a, two, on a, on a zoning that only allows two units. So you have to be um, a single unit on, a, on an R2 zone lot, which is 5,000 of those lots in the city, almost 5,000 of those lots in the city. You, the owner, and this was for, to help to protect home ownership, the property on which the ADU is located, the owner of that property has to live on the property. They could own the house and live in the house. They could, for whatever reason, decide to want to live in the ADU as long as that owner of that property is on the property. Um, a lot of this came out of some of the conversation that was happening out, out west uh, where they allowed ADUs and what happened is developers simply, they were trying to do that to help control or help create supply and help then lower prices. What happened is developers grabbed a hold of that and now they could spend, instead of spending a million dollars for a property, a single family home, they go and spend a million two for a single family home, be, know that they can add another accessory dwelling unit on it. So it kind of had an opposite effect. Um, so this was to help protect the, the home ownership um, and help support home ownership in our community um, rather than allowing um, just more and more more rental. Not that there's anything wrong with rental, but the idea was to, 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 to support and promote um, ownership. If, may I interject? Um, if so, it, this is language to such that the permit to build a new ADU can't be permitted unless the, those conditions are met. What happens in the future after it's built in compliance with these rules and then the property transfers? So we have language on that at the end of this. Okay, keep going, Good sorry. No more <laughs> interruptions from me. Can I ask another clarifying question? Yeah. Uh, you've been very helpful explaining this too, if you don't mind, Mr. Chair. Yeah, um, so, I also know of other uh, instances in, in Ohio City and here where there's, there's families that own properties and their kids live there or other family members. They're not the owner, but they're the kids of the owner or whatever, and then the grandma lives in the back and it's like a family sort of uh, comp or a trust owns that property, for instance. Does that affect, how does that work into this? That'd be a good question for us to, once we, That'd be something we'd have to evaluate on a case by case basis yeah. to understand how the trust is set up is is in in who is it that that's in the owner who who is it that's actually on the property right. um, the that'd be something we'd have to we'd have to sit down and look at uh, together and I, I understand what you're trying to accomplish it makes a lot of sense yeah. uh, but I certainly wouldn't want folks like that I know of these families too that have maybe the property has been in the family for a couple of generations and now it's in a trust because grandma died and they want to build a, a thing in the back to, for the kids, and that's exactly, I think, what we're trying to accomplish here is that sort of, you know, keeping the families in Lakewood, keeping the kids, keeping the uh, older adults uh, aging in place, um, yeah. but the, the house happens to be in a trust. I, my family has a trust that owns my mom's house out in Barberton, like, so I wondered how that would be sort of treated. That's all. I think that's it's certainly not, it, it, as long as it, it, it meets the intent of what we're trying to accomplish, and there's, there's not a legal reason why we couldn't do that. It's something we, we'd have to list, look at on a case-by-case -case basis. I, I suspect that at first it would be a denial, then an appeal to DZA. Could be. That's where those intricacies could be and special cases could be explored. All right. Let's, let's get through this in the next three sure. minutes if we can. And then. Um, so then the, the rest of this then is really getting into um, the meat about... Um, some of the building, the part building department wanted some information in here, even though this is, this is already clearly stated in our building code, they want to make sure that someone who's picking this up understands that they need to, they may, there might be some additional things that they need to do if they're going to build over an existing garage with the building department. Um, some of this is locational. We wanted to not, you can't put an accessory building in the front of the structure. It has to be off to the side. It has to be off to the rear. Um, we looked at the sizes, and so again, trying to keep the scale and the character of these accessory dwelling units appropriate with, um, with the with the principal structure. Um, these are some 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 minimum and maximum areas. So we we didn't establish a minimum area other than what it's supposed to be by the building code, and then the maximum is it's it's basically 50% of the gross floor area uh, or lot coverage of the principal structure. So if you have a 1500, if if your single family home takes up a, has a 1500 square foot footprint on the on the property. You can have a, a ADU that's 750 square feet, which is a, a, a decent sized um, rental unit in our community. That, that partly is dependent on whether I have my basement 
finished basement or my attic. Actually, I'm uh, just looking at the footprint. So okay. it doesn't matter if he, if your basement's finished or up there, the attic's finished. We're just looking at the footprint. Okay. Again, this is trying to control the horizontal scale of, of the build or of the ADU, and then we have other requirements. That actually, the next section talks about the height. So you're saying 50% of the principal structures footprint footprint, which isn't going to be that big for a lot of um, R2. And, and a lot of them, it's 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 going to be probably in that that 600 to 700 square okay. foot range. Um, okay. There were some units in Birdtown that we found. They have um, a first floor footprint of maybe 700 square feet. So that's still a 350 square foot ADU, um, which there's ADUs as small as, I think it's 150, 175 square feet. So um, you're still getting a decent size. So it's, a, it's an efficiency. It's an efficiency. Okay. Yeah. So in those cases, yeah, thanks. So the next thing is about the heights. Again, just following really what the standard code is for height. Um, if you're attaching it, you can't be any higher than the principal structure that you're attaching to. Um, you have to have a review by ABR. We do require that you have to have an off-street parking space to serve the ADU. Um, there was a lot of discussion on this topic, but we ultimately decided that, uh, again, protection of the neighborhood, parking is, a, it, parking is the number one thing we talk about, unfortunately, in the planning department, which is not something you want to talk about all the time. But in order to, 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 to help make sure that the the property itself can support the ADU. One parking space is required. Most homes already meet that because they have a two-car garage or you have a side-by-side -side where you, you only have to have one car for the, for the home. So you just have to provide that second home, and most homes already have that space. Yeah, just on that, if you could just, just for my clarity, just expand on what would constitute that designated one-off one street parking space. You said if you have a two-car garage, that's good enough. Two car garage would count. You actually probably have four. In that case, you really have four parking space because you have two in the garage and you have two behind. Um, typically, we don't count stacked spaces like that. So, you, effectively, you have two. You, you have two. You, if you have a two car garage, you have two spaces already. Uh, so, you're already meeting the minimum of requirement. For uh, backtracking to point eight, is that height hmm. definition generous enough to allow above garage? Which one? I'm sorry. Point number eight, or subsection eight, for accessory, you know, uh, for accessory dwelling units that are detached or attached to an accessory structure, the maximum height shall be that applicable to for an accessory structure. In no instance shall the height be higher than the principal structure. So, your average single-story garage is however high it is. We're talking about the principal, so we're, we're comparing it back to the principal structure. I understand. So. Yeah, and just in practical terms, is there enough? And, and Mr. Sanderson thinks the answer is yes. Not, maybe not in every single case, but in enough cases that that is a viable option for a portion of those 5,000 we're talking about. In, in the instance of a single level ranch style primary residence, that would be a challenge. But again, if the ADU was behind it, you wouldn't want this monster of an ADU Understood. looming over the top. There aren't of the that, ranch, many and there's not that many ranches. No. So for the classic Lakewood R2. home, um, there is room. Okay, thanks. Very good. Almost um, there. Reference to the fire code um, as far as addressing, this was very important for the fire department, especially when we start to have units behind units and they're not visible from the street. So uh, acknowledge to the, to the, to the addressing, um, establishing that you can't split this property and sell it, it's gotta remain with the lot. Um, there was a discussion about short-term rentals. Um, the, the goal with this was not to promote short-term rentals, and so we set a, a minimum rental term of 180 days. Um, and the last point then is to Councilman, and your point, Councilman Bullock, Mr. Chairman, you had mentioned um, what happens when a property transfers. So um, there were some examples around the country. I think we actually looked at, at, at Cincinnati for this. They they're actually go so far as they have um, civil penalties. Um, which is, is a whole nother animal, but we, we thought it was important based on some of the precedent that they were setting is, let's record this on the property, that if you're gonna have an ADU, you're gonna have a conditional use, because that's the point in time, a title company, people are gonna be looking at that, that transfer because that's, the city's oftentimes not looking at that transfer. So now there's something that at least triggers um, a review at that point in time um, that will hopefully make its way back, back to us um, at the city. So with that, that's, that's, that's the changes. Quick question. Um, point 13, does that, 
I certainly don't agree with the law, but it's a law, the rent control law that was passed last year. Does that comport with that? You might want to check that. Maybe you did. I don't think the short-term rental law. Right. I believe that was pass. just introduced. It didn't, didn't pass. pass? No, it was oh, just okay. introduced. Well, that's good then. Yeah. Um, that makes me happy. Up for changing that, lowering that to 90 days, just that we do, I mean, people come up here for internships in the summer and things like that, possibly account for those type of um, rentals, which I think would, you know, be good for the city. It wouldn't be a detriment to the city, but definitely would serve people and students that would need a rental that is not 180 days, but 90 days, summer's worth, a semester's worth of time. Somebody's studying abroad or in Cleveland for some reason, um, maybe to be in Lakewood. Okay, Mr. Sanderson. If, if I may, um, I, I think that's, that's reasonable, but I will tell you that in most markets that have a lot of student rentals, the terms tend to be for an entire year because they don't want to get stuck only having a short period. Six months was sort of split in half, and I don't think there's really any bottom or you know, top number would be onerous, but a bottom number was mostly just to make sure it wasn't a you know, short-term rental, Airbnb kind of thing. Um, good discussion. The, um, can you repeat on the fire code? The point is that just a separate fire safety inspection will be conducted. Actually, no, th that was just simply to make sure that there is address posting that takes place in accordance with the Ohio Fire Code. It's, it's one of those belt and suspenders. It's, it's required when they go through their permit process, but um, the fire department uh, felt strongly enough that they wanted to make sure it was contemplated as part of the conditional use, and someone was thinking about how they're going to address. What's the effect that they know that there's a, a, an additional residence to check how if there's an emergency posted, response? How it gets posted on the property is, okay. is what this is dealing with. and so. Okay. There's addressing standards within um, the Ohio Fire Code about okay. how big the letters are supposed to be, the color, the, how discernible they are, and then I believe where they're placed as well. So the effect is that the post, the mail carrier, and everybody else can find the property, or that the fire uh, response team can respond. It, it helps the mail carrier. Mail carrier helps the Amazon delivery guy, but it's it's really so when the fire department's there on the heat of the moment. When they, they know to up, check. They know they okay. can, the, the addresses are plainly visible, so they know where it's at. Very good. All right. Well, I think this is great work, and I'm inclined before we end in seven minutes to entertain a motion to report this out the, uh, as, as uh, amended and recommended by the Planning Commission. Before doing that, I wanted a little discussion. Um, I know you've got a potential change. I would love to hear from these folks quickly. You want yeah, to I really don't have any change. The only changes that I would consider would be the one – about meant. parking and possibly the 90 day, which I understand. I mean, it would be more of a, a floor, though. Who knows how many people would actually take advantage of it? Um, and just as a process point, I think we would have to make a motion to incorporate the Planning Commission's recommendations into the ordinance because this isn't a substituted as of yet or. Do you have a draft that's incorporated into so, already? So I was I was going to say this for the end, but we, we do have a, a draft of a substitute. We were we were hoping to have this conversation this evening because the, the, the changes are pretty extensive. Mm -hmm. So before we finalize this, have this conversation, we'll finalize a substitute draft to, to then give to you all on the floor on okay. Monday night. Okay. okay. So, so before we get into the mechanics, um, Planning Commission members, we've done all the talking despite my intent to not do that. Floor is yours. Can you share any additional thoughts, and maybe those are big picture thoughts, um, about what this accomplishes, what tool this would add to the city for housing policy purposes, and what it doesn't accomplish, or it's not intended to do, do so? I, I can speak to that. I, I really appreciate this, this discussion and this opportunity to come in and speak. Um, and I, I just wanted to highlight a little bit on, on the decision. The initial you know, recommendation was focusing on um, affordab the affordability component. And through our discussions, we, we got into really the affordability for whom. And um, uh, Mr. Langer's point, you know, we're not demonizing renters. I started out as a renter here in Lakewood, right? Um, 
but really the trend we're seeing out west certainly, and then actually even more so locally here, um, the VAPAC, the Vacant Abandoned Properties Action Council, um, produced a report um, last year um, that talks about countywide investor investors throughout the throughout the, the region and investor buyers of one and three family one through three family homes nearly tripled from 2004 is at seven percent um, in 2020 it was 21.1 percent so that means that means a fifth of all um, purchases of, of, of one two or three family home in Cuyahoga County was to an, an investor and, um, and and what that's happening anecdotally talking to neighbors talking to I'm sure you're talking to your constituents folks that are that are you know renting here in Lakewood, wanting to buy a home, are, are, are forced out of the market because they're competing with um, competing with uh, cash offers, you know, with waiving all inspection requirements because you have outside investors looking to purchase these properties. And while this is an important tool in producing more units for the city, um, we, we felt it necessary to build into it protections to make sure that we protect the essential character of the neighborhoods, uh, encourage home ownership investors, investors, but still allow for additional rental properties. So I'm, I'm pleased that, that um, it sounds like we have support in that and from that angle, but um, you know it's just something that's, that's very alarming, concerning we're seeing across the county. So appreciate that consideration. Additional thoughts from other members of the Planning Commission? Uh, I don't have much further to add, and I, I think um, the couple points of making sure that we protected the single family structure and the single family home, and how do we still make this work? And we spent a lot of time looking at where do we position lower level, how do we build a structure off adjacent, and then we also dove into the attached and or how do we use the garage as a tool. Um, and we spent a lot of time going through the pros and cons in each. So I'm, I'm very happy with the product that uh, came out at the end. Super. How about Mr. Sanderson? Uh, Kyle did a great job of leading us through the discussion, and Sean did, and his staff did a great job of pr providing a lot of information. So I think um, there's always a little bit of compromise. You know, we would all prefer to have a lot more units available, but the reality is, you know, there is a, a single family and home ownership element here that, as was mentioned, is, you know, it's kind of a tricky, and I'd rather err on that side. I think that keeps the community strong and is to the extent we can find other places to continue to push for more housing, uh, especially apartment development, and that's where affordable can really come in. The other thing is whenever you increase the supply of something, you either slow the cost increase down or you make it uh, lower. So, you know, build more houses everywhere will help with the affordability issue. Right now, I think our biggest problem is there's more demand than there is supply. and. This will help. It won't solve the problem, but it'll be a step in that direction. And thank you for the opportunity to meet with you guys. Super. Yeah, thank you for the thoughtful and detailed work. It seems to me that the this is a valuable tool. It's, increment, it's an incremental proposal. It's targeted currently only at R2 and R2 with single family structures, not with multi, well, not with doubles and triples. Uh, it doesn't include R1 of any cat category currently. So that's a big chunk of the city um, that could remain for a future proposal once we get a little bit of uh, a real world experience with this potentially, um, as I understand. So, um, you know, so, so we could also, um, there's a couple other uh, 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 features of of this version that could be expanded or or added in the future, um, once we see how it actually plays out in real time, you know, see see if you agree with this characterization. It may not be a primary tool for us to enhance affordability in the near term in this market today or in the next five years, maybe ten years, but it could over time help. But what it does do in the near term would be to add resiliency to our housing stock flexibility. So a, a, a property owner that is here today that may be looking for a second or third home outside of Lakewood may have new flexibility to enhance their property, the, the, the use mix that they could find on their own lot. It could be a accessory dwelling unit they use as a home office. It could be 
an in-law suite. It could be a, um, a college kid coming back home or a recent graduate coming back home, any of those uses, right? And it could just enhance the value of, and, and use of, of an existing lot. Uh, it certainly adds density. Density, we've learned as a core, it's not really new, but we continue to appreciate how density in Lakewood is such a strength in every sense when it, when it comes from infrastructure, uh, our population, our talent pool. So this is another um, opportunity to enhance density. Um, so it, 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 it would add to quality and flexibility of the, of the uh, community for sure, and maybe over time could be a dimension of affordability. But I hear uh, Bill Sanderson's point loud and clear that it's probably the multifamily uh, developments that we do hope to get moving as soon as possible here that are going to be the immediate shot in the arm for affordability by just adding significant numbers of new units. Um, any concluding thoughts in a quick uh, fashion by council members? Mayor George, thank you for um, being here. Any thoughts from you before we uh, continue? No, thank you. I appreciate the Planning Commission's work on this, and I think we've come up with a, a, a good proposal here. So thank you to everyone who, who worked on this. I'm excited okay. about it. Super. So um, Councilman Schachter, you have that one proposed language uh, change for from 180 to 90 days. We could try to consider that here. Another option would be to reserve the, the uh, continued discussion and consider for, for a floor of full council. Um, okay, so you're not gonna propose it tonight. Okay, Councilwoman Marks, do you wanna add something? Okay, so was it, there was one other point I think you mentioned? Okay, um, Director, Planning Commission, if the councilman who's the initial author of this, uh, well, it was, it was, I remember clearly, um, Councilman Schachter uh, planted the flag and put a lot of uh, time and energy and rhetorical focus on, on this issue. So the, the co-authors, if the co-authors were to come forward with some refinements, um, could we proceed through an informal discussion that then would get a uh, uh, you know, formal discussion of public meeting as, as is required potentially at our next full council hearing, meeting rather. Is that agreeable? As a possible approach, okay. So that may uh, be forthcoming, but not tonight. So what we wanna do is um, structure a motion so that we can uh, report favorably out of committee to the full council, this work product. On our um, I legislate app, which is our formal agenda, we do have two versions. We've got um, amendments final as a document. Does, do you see that, Councilman Schachner? Okay. Okay. So, okay, please do. I would move to recommend to full council the incorporation of the Planning Commission's um, recommendations and recommend passage with those recommendations. Okay. So we'll move to report out uh, proposed ordinance 7-2023 to the full council with the um, proviso that that incorporate the recommended amendments from the Planning Commission. Sure. Yes. Okay. So that, that that's the motion and I will second that motion. And, it and uh, any discussion on the motion? Hearing no discussion, all in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. The ayes have it. I like to do the formal process. Um, that concludes our business. Any final comments from the administration, from the Planning Commission, from council colleagues? Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for the additional time. I do know that the Planning Commission put in a lot of effort already in the Planning Commission meetings. I hope you found it fruitful. I, I certainly did to have this joint discussion and to really continue and to deepen our, our education on this. You know, anything that we do to housing really is almost like the, the built environment constitution of our community and the economy of our community. So I think there's wisdom that our charter requires these uh, lasting changes that go also through planning commission and we've done good work here. 
Without objection, the committee is adjourned.